So um, hello to everybody, and uh, definitely uh, excited to be here again. Uh, I think the last time I was here outside of uh, Jennifer's class was uh, the the entrepreneur week, and uh, and oh, and base. I, I came and did something with base. Um, but but anyway, it was uh, it was very exciting. I love the exchanges, and I'm gonna focus today on uh, you know branding, personal branding, and of course utilizing. You know, social media. One thing I just did was I, uh, I tweeted out, it says Stanford Biz. So would you, um, for everybody who's on Twitter right quick, just kind of uh, check out my Twitter feed right quick. And the notes are there, <laughs> the random notes, just random. It says Stanford Biz. And if you click on it, it has like four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 12 little thoughts. And uh, I'll be working kind of from those thoughts. Sure, sure. If you if uh, just go to MC Hammer at, at Twitter, because there's a real correlation between you know personal branding and corporate branding, and I've been watching uh, all the things that are happening right now with some of my favorite uh, uh, companies out there. Obviously, I'm I'm a big fan of all the social media companies. Uh, Tristan, I met right here, right? Tristan came out of. Uh, I actually met him first at an event. Uh, he's over at Foursquare now, but I think uh, you talk to Tristan all the time, right? Uh, uh, so Foursquare is one of you know one of the companies I I really think that uh, has got it right, uh, along with uh, obviously the traditional companies and the ecosystem around Twitter and some other yeah right there yeah. Um, so as soon as he does that, I'll, I'll jump right into it. I just came in from Atlanta. I was at the uh, Black Enterprise. Uh, Entrepreneurs Conference 2011. I uh, had a good time with that and uh, got back in probably around you know midnight or, or one o'clock. I'm doing like you guys are doing the final week, right? You burning both ends. Uh, I asked the last class some random questions about some current events. And nobody knew anything. <laughs> it's like everybody is unplugged from everything. So, um, how many fans of uh, Lady Gaga? <laughs> See, now here we go. <laughs> yes, a, a bunch of Lady Gaga fans. Uh, so one, one thing I wanted to emphasize was a, you know, personal branding. Uh, I want to define it, right? And uh, defining a personal brand, uh, Lady Gaga is a very good example. Uh, I, I, would, I would argue with anyone that uh, the culture of her brand, and by the way, personal branding equates to the culture of you. So the culture of you, right? So the culture of you, uh, utilizing Lady Gaga, her culture is now bigger than the music, and the music is good, and it's very big. And, and what do I mean uh, by that? And how did she end up defining that culture? Well, from one aspect, uh, early on, uh, the community uh, tried to do, uh, define what her brand was, right? And the thing about that is, is that the community may not even be fans of your product, right? So, you know, we have the behaviors at iTunes. There is a group of individuals at iTunes. No matter whose album comes out, doesn't matter. They go to that album, uh, to that artist site, and they attack. <laughs> they, one star, one star, half a star. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But they don't even like the band. They're not even a fan of the band. So it sends out the wrong message to non-fans because they really think that someone is reviewing the product, the album, and uh, giving it negative reviews. So one of the great things of, about social media is what? We get to control the messaging to a certain extent. So one of the things you want to always do is have your fans go on your night when your product is being released and give it to five stars <laughs> all the way down. But uh, there was a group trying to define her brand early on. Who is Lady Gaga? What she's about? Blah, blah, blah. Finally, her in-house camp took control of the message. So once they took control of the message, you started to see who she is socially, politically, and defined her look, right? Uh, she, she, her look has progressed, by the way, right? So what it is today is not the same as two years ago, but what it does is it separates her immediately from all of the other 20 million bands that are out there that are trying to carve their niche. So uh, who, who's like a huge fan of Lady Gaga, like a huge fan, a big fan, a big fan? So what would you say the culture of her brand is, if you were to uh, surmise it? So she creates a cult. She's like the mother monster. It's like everyone is a monster. All her concerts are monster balls. 
all, all the audience are little monsters, and she said, this is my face, I believe in you. Um, there's some like anti-Christianity message in there, but she used that to, like, uh, what's it called, uh, Luciferism. Uh, but she used those like a lot in her videos and uh, in how she dressed. So that's a lot of information, right? <laughs> That's a lot, a lot of information. So if, if you pointed out about seven or eight things that defined her brand, number one, she, she mobilized her audience and gave them a name. They're the monsters. So uh, this means that in, in many respects, my fans are my fans, right? So when I speak, I'm not speaking to you. I'm not speaking even to the people who go on iTunes or Amazon or anywhere else uh, who are not fans and make negative comments because I make music for the monsters. That's very important. That's also very important uh, for corporations out there who are, uh, you know, this is why the analytics work so well. With, with the analytics, you're able to, to, to look at the information, then do your targeting and say, this is who I'm trying to reach, right? This is who, this is who it's all about. We, we're doing that in music right now uh, in a way that's never been done before because of all the social media tools that are available. Um, another thing that you pointed out, uh, uh, about Lady Gaga is that uh, she has a social and a political message. And uh, I think it was recently, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I believe it was Target or, or one of the retailers that uh, had a difference of opinion, I, I believe, uh, with her message or, or the fans of her music or a cause that she didn't agree with. So she made it known to them, listen, if you're not going to support my monsters and their... Uh, uh, their ide ide ideology, then I don't necessarily want you to carry my product. Now, I don't know which store that was for sure, so since we're live streaming, but her political and social position is as much a part of the culture of her brand as her music. So if you take personal branding today and you want to separate yourself, if you want to do it the most efficient way, start defining, defining your brand early, right? Define who you are. It's no longer good enough to be the best singer, even though there's a new show out called The Voice, right? <laughs> and it's about focusing on the voice. Uh, previously, you could just focus on the voice, and the best singer would be the one. But today, with transparency, real time, all this information available 24 hours a day, you have to be willing to define what your brand is, what the culture of your brand is early on, and it will help you to carve out your niche uh, and kind of take off and get out in front of everybody. So, or at least uh, theoretically, it can allow you uh, to take off. So I was gonna align, oh, can you click on that link? Or I'll, I'll click on it. No, it's okay, I have it. No, I know I have it. So I, so I was gonna give an example of Cisco. How many familiar with uh, products from Cisco? So, so what's the, what's the one of the products from Cisco that you're familiar with? Routers. Routers. Anybody else? Random. Switches, and and yours was the most important one because I, this is the point that I'm going to make. So, Cisco is known for switches and routers. Now, this is just an analogy between personal branding, corporate branding, showing that they're basically there's a lot of parallels. So they decided now that the new step will, step will be, and this is going back about 18 months, they're going to get into their own devices. They want to brand uh, hardware. They want to brand, they want to put Cisco on things, and they took this great piece of product that I'm a big fan of called the Flip, right? And the problem was that from my perspective, uh, is that they didn't utilize what I'm calling, again, marathon branding, uh, and start to seed the public with the idea that Cisco would now offer more than just routers and switches. It's hard to get people to adjust to a new behavior from nowhere, right? As, as I go down 10 miles and make a right, that's where the milk and the flour is. And so I, that becomes subconsciously my habit. If you move the milk somewhere else, for the first couple of months, I'm still gonna get there, start to make that right, and then adjust and make the left. No one was looking for hardware from Cisco. They weren't looking for earphones, they're not looking for anything, they're looking for switchers, routers, infrastructure, right? 
So the marathon branding approach is the idea, and the, but, uh, the underlining thing is the culture of you, but the idea that you start to see the new behavior early and you stick with it. So I think one of the challenges that Cisco had was that, number one, they weren't, they weren't uh, willing to run the marathon. They gave it a shot. Uh, they tried, and much to my dismay, because I'm a big fan of the flip, they decided to kill the product. This, it's no longer even in the product line anymore, and uh, it went away. So when you're establishing a new behavior, when you're a brand that has been around and you're going to transition, you're going to start to introduce new features, new products, you have to see the behavior early. Another example I wanted to give is uh, Google. As Google is beginning to move into music, which is not what you think, right? You Google for information, right? You Google for Gmail, right? Check your Gmail. You don't necessarily Google for music, not yet. Now there's rumors and there's leaks and things that say that now Google is going to focus on music. How many, are, uh, how many people in here are aware of that? So there's 10 or 12 people who are aware that music is going to be a part of the culture of Google. Well, my suggestion would be to Google, take a page out of the music industry, one of the very few pages that you would take, because it, you know, it took a long time, and the music industry is still adjusting to what this new world is. But take a page out just from this aspect. Leak it. Uh, when, you, when you hear that music is being leaked uh, from, from an artist, it's normally the label themselves leaking it. It's not nobody hacked into a server. None of that happened. This is a way of beta testing the product, hoping that the community will decide what the single is. If, if Google is going to be a place for music, then they should go ahead and step out now and start to talk about Google being the place for music. And uh, a company that did it and does it very well, Microsoft, they're in the marathon br uh, branding. They'll take something like the Xbox, which is, which is you know, a great, uh, I love the Xbox, right? Great gaming device, great console. And they'll say, listen, we're late to the space. We didn't get in early. We're going to set aside X amount of dollars, and we're going to carve, we're willing to lose money on the hardware. You know, that Xbox is not a prof profitable piece of, uh, of hardware, but we're in it for the long haul. We'll fine tune the product. But we're here, and they started talking about it. They delivered. It's a great, you know, it's a great console, center of your living room. And they rolled it out, and today, all of us, not all of us, but at some point, if you like games, you, you've had an Xbox, right? Uh, and then they integrated, uh, which, again, I should actually say I, I participated in that. I went down to uh, New Zealand uh, and Australia and helped uh, introduce uh, the social media integration uh, uh, into the Xbox a couple years ago. But um, I, I only put that example up there to, that so that you can see that Xbox, Microsoft, even with Bing, right, search. Everybody knows what Bing is now. So Microsoft has a history of going uh, the distance in terms of branding, marathon branding, getting in, sticking with it, and riding it. On this one point with Cisco, because I don't know what the other things they were doing, but when they decided to go from infrastructure switches to hardware, I don't think that they thought that they would stick it out. It was a test. It was an open test without declaring it as a test. So the, the, uh, the parallels between personal branding and corporate branding are very similar. And th there'll be even more when you take a look. Now, Apple, one of my favorites all time. I'm a, I'm a, how many Apple fans in here? The whole room, see? <laughs> Apple has a, a way of of making sure that you know what they're doing without saying they're going to do it. They, they do it very well. They, they make sure you know what they're going to, you know, what's coming without saying what's coming, but it is coming, right? <laughs> and right now, the next thing that they're going to do, and I'll, I'll come back to this, but the next thing they're going to do is they're going to offer the locker. They're going, they're going to beat everybody to music storage, which the competitors in that space, uh, Amazon, the music industry itself, uh, 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 well, you know, in some aspect, possibly Facebook and Google. Um, I don't know the intimate details. I'm just throwing it out there. But here comes Apple again, out of nowhere. 
How did they do it and how are they getting it done? And how do they do that so fast? Well, one is, is that once they make a decision, it seems like for the most part, they stick with it. They leak out and they, they, uh, they make it known without making it known that we're coming, you better be ready, and when we do it, we'll make it user friendly, the interface will be great, the, ex the personal experience will be great, and the design will be great. So um, personal branding and, and corporate branding, they, they're very much aligned, whether it's an artist or whether it's a product. What I was going to say about Apple and uh, distribution uh, in the music industry was uh, a few years ago, there was, you know, these deals, these licensing deals that were being cut that, you know, helped to, to set up the iTunes store. So all the labels had to participate. And I was having a debate with some of my music industry friends that uh, the music industry is no longer uh, in Hollywood or anywhere else in New York, but it's really based in Silicon Valley. And of course, at that time, they laughed. The music industry is not in Silicon Valley. I said, yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's now here. Uh, it started with the creation of the MP3. Once the community had the ability to download uh, music and share music, uh, the control of the music industry left uh, Hollywood, New York, and now it was controlled globally by the community. But they, uh, of course, they couldn't understand that at the time. Well, the next piece was when, when Apple was able to, to make a deal with the, the labels for this little project, uh, just another little project we're doing, called the iTunes Store, and you'll be able to buy music here. Well, now uh, it's no longer speculation, but you know the bulk of all music is bought through, through Apple, and clearly uh, the head of the music industry, the power, the control, is here in Silicon Valley. So when you are defining a brand, um, and again, what was Apple at that time, by the way? Before Apple was music, what was Apple, by the way? What, what, what did you see Apple as? Personal computer? I mean, no, not personal computers. Uh, but it was, it was about video, right? At the end of the day, it was about art. People who are into art, they loved Apple products. Later on, after they took over the music business, and now... Uh, Netflix is doing a great job, by the way. But now, uh, you know, videos and entertainment, all of this equates to Apple. The culture of who they are uh, is bigger, but not arguably, not, not more so than their products because the iPhone, obviously, is a great product and the rest of their products are great. But Apple does a great, great job at uh, just establishing their culture and also running the distance with Marathon, uh, with marathon branding. So I, I thought that I'd point those out and that uh, I would share the fact that uh, if you are, if you're going to um, shift your brand, transition uh, via brand that uh, is nimble in the marketplace going forward, the fastest way, most efficient way uh, is to utilize the social media tools to, number one, uh, to get a gauge, to, to test resistance, to get a gauge on what people feel uh, about your new shift. Um, to, I said in the last class, was kind of, you know, very quickly, we did a, a, a real short uh, synopsis of it, but I said, you know, you take a brand that's been around for a while in the music industry like Beyonce, when it's time to reassert yourself, take your lane back, you come out, you point to things that were uh, affiliated and associated with you in the past, like Destiny Child was about independent women and, you know, girl power and things like that. Her new song is about girls, girls, power, but it's, it's a new, uh, reinvigorated, her competition theoretically right now would have been, uh, in some aspects, Rihanna and maybe a couple of other, but what she did was quickly reestablish her lane, her brand, what the new culture will be about, the culture of her, because she truly is a marathon brander. Um, even when she's away, she maintains her presence and continues continue to add to the story which is also one other point that I'll make that's very important, is you being in control of telling the story of who your brand is. It is, it is you know, without a doubt, the most important aspect today because all of your competitors want to tell your story, all of them. Um, it's ruthless out there right now, right? Uh, if you look at the competition, everybody tells the other guy's story, but when you take, take control, utilizing these tools, uh, and tell the story yourself, 
uh, you're almost unbeatable uh, because if they say this, then you say that. If you look at Starbucks, as Starbucks has retold the new story, um, and there is, what, oh, they were in the last class. There's a couple students in the last class who are doing something around caffeine, right? And uh, uh, I don't know, how many caffeine lovers in here? It's the only way you're going to get through these finals. <laughs> uh, um, Starbucks has done a fantastic job at uh, repositioning the brand, right? Uh, because again, they run the marathon. They embrace uh, digital and social uh, in a big way. And some of their competitors were beginning to get some traction. But once they reasserted themselves, embraced it, uh, I'll say since we're online, uh, shout out to their digital head, uh, Steve. Um, yes, yeah, Steve. Not that I don't know your name, but I'm saying yes, yeah, Steve. Um, he does a great job, uh, Senior Vice President uh, of Understanding and Pushing Forward. Uh, I happen to know him where? I know him from my Twitter stream. <laughs> He's always on checking people out and, and interacting. So if your brand has been around for a while and uh, you want to decide to reposition yourself, there's no better place, no better platform than social media and using the social tools to do that. Um, before we go too far or get too far, I had a couple, um, I wanted to set aside at least five or 10 minutes for to answer a couple questions. And I had a couple more things I wanted to say. So I think you had a question earlier, Jim. Or you made a statement earlier. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And, and what was your thoughts around the flip, uh, the, the whole, uh, the, we, can, we can call it uh, debacle in some aspects? Uh, well, I think Cisco got into a business where they weren't prepared to go. I mean, they got into a consumer product business and they weren't a previously consumer product focused company. And they had a really hard time going with that. I think, anyway, that's why, why I think they did. Just to add to that, so I worked uh, at Flip for a while. <coughs> And basically what, yeah, so basically what happened was really Cisco inability to transition from the B2B to the B2C. And the way for you to see that is like you were expecting to sell at least 100,000 units at each batch or to have, you know, 40% margins that they were able, they used to in the routers were, but it was just not possible in the consumer electronics space. So you work, uh, we're working with uh, Jonathan Kaplan, yeah? Um, what was the atmosphere like for uh, for Flip within the Cisco uh, uh, culture? So they tried to keep us apart, even out in the cool office in San Francisco, far away from San Jose headquarters. But every time that you had to get out of the office in San Francisco and have any sort of interaction with the bigger Cisco organization, you you were just reminded that you have all these like boundaries and all these walls on yourself, and everything was just like really, really difficult. So it would take me, you know, 30 minutes to approve something with my boss and Jonathan, and then two weeks to get the lawyers from, uh, you know, legal department to approve what we're trying to do. So even though our focus is on branding, um, you saw that I put the culture runs parallel with branding, and what you just described was that there was a tremendous culture clash, right? That the cultures didn't mix. So even internally, uh, there was a big problem with the culture. So this, the culture of what Flip was, and, and I know Jonathan, and I was uh, at Flip at the beginning, and I used to come over to the office in San Francisco because, again, if it's around, you know, rich media, social, I'm there, right? I'll, I'll sniff you out real quick. Um, <laughs> so so the, the culture in San Francisco for Flip was outstanding. You know, you come up there. First of all, you guys are right there. Uh, what's the little street in the alley? Overlooking the ballpark in the marina. Well, that's great for creativity. That's, that's a great starting place. And so I used to go over there. But culture around branding is so important that uh, this is what I was going to actually say about Google. So if Google is shifting into music, anybody ever been over to the Google campus? Isn't that like the greatest playground, <laughs> um, circus, uh, what did you, you got about what five different uh, restaurants in in the lunchroom, seven chefs. Now, that is a great environment, very akin to music, right? Uh, open colors, all of that. So if I'm Google, and my actual culture is, if you ever come to visit us, we got the greatest creative, lively volleyball. 
uh, the founders riding around on, uh, on uh, futuristic scooters. It, it, it really, you know, this is all happening in real life. So music obviously is a natural part of what Google is, right? I mean, that's entertainment, that's creativity. So I would start to market the culture of who I really am. I'm not just uh, search. I'm, I'm not just, you know, your male. I'm actually the most creative place, arguably, you know, in the valley. And the arguably would be Facebook, right? They, Facebook would say, hammer, stop right there, hold, holding your tracks. So, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm a big fan of Facebook as well. But I'm saying, if I'm Google, and I'm getting ready to shift into music, I'll start my marathon branding now. My new introduction is, meet what we really look like, the people who work here, the atmosphere, the wash. You can wash your clothes at Google if you work there. <laughs> did, you, did you know that? Yeah, they, they, they get told you at work. You don't know. You don't have to go. You just go and you. What the connection is between like the fun atmosphere, because it's always been, it's, it's been for all it is kind of like a engineering friendly thing. Right. And a lot of engineers are uh, not exactly the same as like, you know, the hip hop persona that's put forth by a lot of the music <laughs> industry. So what is it exactly about the Google, you know, the look and the feel of the place that is very music industry like? Okay, um, well, because music, uh, creation, creating of content, um, it comes from the same side of the brain. That's why, you know, so many uh, artists um, love devices. It's a natural extension of their personality, the creativity. It goes beyond, it doesn't matter genre of music. You'll find that musicians love uh, smartphones, love laptops, love uh, 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 checking in on Foursquare, love it. it it's, it's from the same side of the brain. It's the same uh, characteristic. That, that's, that's what the connection is. Um, and what I was saying was that when you have a brand and a culture uh, like Google, you actually already have built in what you need to shift when you began to introduce new features or new products uh, into the family. And that was the point I was making. So um, uh, that environment is one of the best environments. I used to go over there every week about five or six years ago uh, and sit down with uh, Jennifer Feiken, uh, who was one of the uh, creators of, uh, founders of Google Video, and Orchid, who's an actual person. <laughs> and uh, sit down with Orchid and talk about things, but I would look and see this great campus and this beautiful environment. And so I'm only saying that as a part of marathon branding and the culture of who you are, if you utilize that, it makes it a lot easier to introduce new characteristics, to transition if you're a brand that's been around for a while. All those things, all those, those things are easier. Um, uh, and so, so social media has created transparency. This transparency has created an opportunity for you to extend uh, the life of your brand and um, the wholeness of who you are. Previously, the only way to get this information out was a short story here in a magazine, if a writer does a story here, and maybe if you get lucky, something happens so you know out of the norm, you end up on the news, good or bad, infamous or famous. But with social media and these you know, all, this, all these platforms in real time, we're able to tell the story and get it out. So if you're going to create new behaviors, introduce new products, do these things, marathon branding, um, it's great to use these, these, the social media tools. You mentioned that, first of all, as one of the last classes we're going to take at the GSB, I think it's so awesome. That you <laughs> um, but you mentioned the increased transparency that you have and the wholeness of yourself that you put out there. What do you do about the cases where that whole person transparently exposed is not exactly what you might want for the branding. So I mean, you mentioned Lady Gaga and the Target thing, but you can think of other examples where celebrities have, you know, done something they shouldn't have, and thanks to social media, everyone finds out right away. And when you or a person or a concept are the brand, how do you mitigate those risks? Well, um, so we can go a few ways with that, right? Because one of the problems that has previously been created by both the, the celeb brand uh, and the controllers of the messaging of the brand, right, is that there is this spotless, um, flawless individual, whether he's a musician or an athlete or whoever he is, and it's not realistic. 
Um, one of the things I love about Nike is, when you, again, talking about marathon branding, Nike allows for its athletes, celebs that it's uh, connected with to have flaws, to be real, to have challenges, and they don't just bail out like a lot of brands do. They don't, they don't just bail out. So now you know if you see the Nike product affiliated or associated with an athlete or entertainer that has had any type of challenge, it's not big news to you. It's not abrasive to how you perceive the product because, again, I, I call them a, a marathon brander. They, they made a decision in the house that they would stick with uh, a Michael Vick in some aspect. They, they stick with a Tiger Woods uh, that they stick with. And so the consumer, initially, there may be some uh, feedback, blowback, but what happens is, as, as they see that, listen, we've always been human. And that's what I mean by the whole. So in some aspects, Charlie Sheen, he told you, I'm winning, man. <laughs> it doesn't matter that, from your perspective, uh, I'm no longer at my current job or I'm partying a little too much in, from your perspective uh, or whatever it is that you think. Here I am, transparent. Here's my message. I'm winning. It at least allowed him to balance the field, right? Immediately, he balanced the field for his brand. So, so, so my take is, uh, is that if you utilize these tools, and even though, as you just pointed out, uh, there may come a time where, you know, there's the parting of interest, right? It goes back to, you know, uh, what you just saw politically happening between uh, President Obama and uh, who? Just like yesterday. No, no, no. That's yeah, but that too. Yes, Netanyahu. Just recently, right? So you would have two, two things happening, and you have your interests, and then you have uh, your moral position, and that's what they're debating: the interests and moral positions. That's the big debate. No matter what side of the fence, no matter how deep you dig, moral and interest. That's being played out right before us, and sometimes. Um, you just have to let these things play out, be debated, and then you, you try to take best practices and work them out. So um, that's the same thing with being whole and being open and being transparent. Uh, you got to take the good with the bad. Like, um, personal favorites or personal examples about smaller companies that kind of adapt to marathon brand kind of strategy. Just like they don't have as much funding, but like they still kind of have that drive to go forward. Right. Right. Hey. The challenge with that is, is that most of the companies that are small, they don't, they don't stay small long anymore, right? It, it happens, uh, you, you have to turn away capital these days, right, currently in this environment. Um, but but uh, to your point, if, if I were to just, you know, think of some, uh, you know, some small companies uh, that are doing things, there, there's a ton of them, because um, I, I like the startup culture. So there's a lot of startups right now that are doing a lot of great things. Look at the App Store. Like, look at your favorite apps on, uh, on the iPad. A lot of those apps are, are already so much a part of my day-to-day -day life, I, I, like, you know, I couldn't do without them or I wouldn't want to do without them. And then on the other side, I have to say that companies like, you know, uh, um, uh, Flip, not uh, Flipboard, Flipboard. Uh, I really love, you know, their product, and I'm, you know, um, Big fan of it. Uh, the way you know, consuming you know, social media uh, uh, in a digital magazine, the way that it's done is outstanding. So that's a company that that I that, that I like a lot. That's smaller right now, but won't be small long. So, to the point you made about the transparency, I'm actually a designer for Nike, and I work with Dick and a lot of those athletes. Right? Um, I think the difference in when you position yourself from an image standpoint is that with a company like Nike, we have people that are regarded as aspirational because they do superhuman things. How do you, as a, as a company like a Google, reposition yourself to say, our employees are aspirational, they look like the voice of the consumer, they represent the consumer's interests, when it's so very different than a kid who's growing up uh, trying to get their voice in the world through art and creativity, then they see someone who has a PhD from Stanford and Google, how do you make that connection so, so that that person becomes aspirational for this person over here? But who is the other person? Because so. uh, musicians and artists generally, they're trying to find their way through their voice, right? And their voice is their medium of choice, whether it's music, art, dancing, poetry, um, getting in trouble in some cases. But uh, 
they necessarily don't see themselves as being an employee of Google someday or being a, a person that Google cares about, which is the first step in a brand saying we're going to change our position and do the marathon branding because people can see themselves as a person who the brand cares about. How does Google, which is a faceless, um, formless entity, become humanistic so that a person can say, I see myself as being part of Google. I see myself as someone Google cares about. I see, you know, like... Right, right. So they should start actually doing that. So a presence in the community, right? So if they create a presence in the community outside of their core competency, right? So in other words, um, a lot of us do charity work together here in the Valley all the time, all kind of causes. Now, why not take those tools, all of the tools, right, and let some of the kids in the community tell their stories, and those stories are brought to you by Google. So if, 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 if you go going into my old neighborhood you know, in East Oakland, and you empower and give the tools and say, listen, uh, what is your story? What do you hope to be? Wait, let's make a short film of that. We're going to make a 10-minute film of that. We're going to provide you the tools. Uh, Google has just partnered with, uh, in my case, Brookdale Recreation Center. They're going to put the tools there. You can come there. Now when you create your story, you know that Google cared enough to come to your community. And, not, and believe me, I'm, this is all you know, hypothetical because they do a ton of charity work as well. But it was Google who supplied the necessary means for me to tell my story. I think that's a good starting point, to, to do things like that in the communities um, that you're targeting and the demos that you're targeting, show them that you care by being there. I think it would be a, a good start because it's, uh, it becomes organic and authentic. Can we talk a little bit about personal brand, like how you went through, like how you started shifting preferences through momentum marketing, how you got your music into clubs, how you started um, handling, how, harnessing social media to handle negative feedback um, about you or how to create that dialogue? Sure. Um, so just initially, um, um, you know, social media or any of these platforms starting before we called them social media. So if you go back to the YouTube uh, initial era, um, uh, utilizing YouTube to just get the archives out there was a big important part uh, of my, my own personal brand uh, by saying that you, you may know me for one song, here's another song, another song, here's another album, here's another uh, short film you may have missed about the life of Hammer, all of these things uh, when YouTube first started um, before it did, you know, become the, the behemoth that it is today, but in its infancy, um, I had a lot of presence with a lot of my historical, um, you know, art, my historical music work there, and it helped introduce it or reintroduce it to uh, to different audiences, and so they were able to uh, to get a bigger snapshot of of uh, who I am again as a whole brand. Uh, secondly, um, before it was considered real time and transparency, um, any negative, uh, you know, feedback, I was always quick to make uh, remove the velvet rope and communicate back with um, the crowd. Uh, not to the extent that I was trying to necessarily create a new fan, but to just uh, create the human aspect that we just spoke about. So once I was able to humanize who I am, I'm not uh, a fictitious character from another planet, but I'm actually uh, a person beyond the, the music, beyond the song, beyond the dance. And that connection, uh, utilizing those tools early on, also helped uh, to, to, to deal with any, you know, uh, purported uh, negative feedback. Because all, I, I know my brand better than anybody. So I also knew it at, at the same time that if I'm a brand uh, and I'm the leader in the space, and let's say I sell, uh, you know, 10 billion pairs of sneakers, there might be, uh, you know, another brand out there who is envious of my brand, but at the end of the day, uh, they're still only selling 10 pairs of sneakers. So I'm not going to put too much emphasis on my competitors, and I always knew that as well as a brand. I, I know my brand. So when there is negative feedback, I also consider the source of, my, uh, of the feedback, and are they truly a, a fan of the product or competition? And if it's uh, competition, then I address it in one aspect, and hopefully give them enough information to give them a new perspective. Um, 
But if, if it's a fan, I try to give them uh, enough information to uh, alleviate any fears uh, so that they can continue to, to, to uh, engage for the whole ride, the whole story. So that's how I utilize social media. I'm, I'm, I'm there for, uh, again, whether it's uh, good, bad, or otherwise, but I, do, but I am wise enough to pick and choose on who I engage with. So if I choose to engage you, that means that I see a tremendous upside in answering uh, your challenge and in, in answering um, the competitiveness uh, because I believe that my brand overall and in the marathon of it all uh, in the long term that I'll come out, uh, you know, shining uh, on the other side. So that's kind of my approach to that. Any Building on that point you mentioned earlier about Lady Gaga and the fact that she did two stages. So first she designed her craft a message, then the first audience like, embraced the message and they were the ambassador of that brand. How do you craft strategically this message to make sure you're going to be embraced? Like, how do you design it? How do you work around making sure that a lot of people are trying but not very many succeed? So how do you, you do it? Well, the, the reason why I put the word marathon out in front of branding is that you have to be committed, right? Because the initial feedback when you start to define the brand initially may not be what you thought. You, you may not get the, the, the uh, desired results initially. Um, people may not know who you are. Another good example, if we're just you know, using musicians, uh, in this case, uh, is Nicki Minaj, right? So who she is today is not who she was when she first started, right? But at some point, um, if you, you know, Google her and look at her history, you'll see that she started to introduce more characteristics of who she is as she went along. And I remember in our house uh, early on, I told my, my, my two of my daughters uh, uh, that I like Nicki Minaj, which for them, they was like, Dad, what, 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 what? You know, Dad. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, initially, um, I see a whole lot of talent there, is what I told my daughters. I said, I'm not listening to every word she's rapping right now. That's, that You listen to every word. Daddy's not listening to every word. I'm looking at talent right here. And I felt as though, um, you know, be because in my household, as a father, right, I'm putting my other hat on, in my, I'm raising five kids and two nephews, right? So I'm not the biggest fan of a tremendous amount of profanity being thrown around my house. Just, uh, that's dad, right? So when they heard me say I like Nicki Minaj early, right, which, you know, her early music, they were like, dad, but you don't always, you know, uh, subscribe to blah, blah, blah. I said, well, that's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is I'm seeing other people attack who she is, is what I said at that time. And I said, but I see a greater brand as, you know, down the road, and, you know, I, I'm certainly not the architect of it, but I watched her evolve into who I thought she could become. Um, and the kudos really is to her because I see that she's very independent uh, and she asserts herself. Uh, and uh, so what I'm really saying is that initially the feedback uh, that you're looking for might not be the feedback uh, that you get, but you have to be willing to run the marathon. Now in music, that's tough because uh, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure to make quarterly numbers, which is what helped run the music business uh, because uh, we went from, I'm gonna make a great album and I put 14 songs on and song number one and song, song number 14 actually connect. There's a story here. But when they introduce first week numbers, they change the entire music business. They change it to a game of a, a sport of who hits you know, the most uh, home runs in the first week, not even in the season. You may hit 10 home runs the first week, and that's it. At the end of the year, how many did you hit? 10. But they, they wanted to make quarterly numbers. They needed to. And so they put the emphasis on the first week, the first quarter is what they were trying to do. And so now they, you have to pay for point of purchase. So uh, stores like, um, and it wasn't, you know, obviously just Best Buy at the time because I'm going all the way back, but Best Buy has to, to charge you for point of purchase. So if you want that new album out front for the first week, you want counter space, it was 50 cents for this counter space, now it's $2 because you want it for this week. So that changed the dynamic. So now the record companies could no longer stick with an artist for the marathon for their brand because they had to make first quarter numbers. So you wouldn't have had uh, 
you know, the opportunity, which again is uh, kudos to, you know, Cash Money uh, and, and, uh, and their company and, and, and Birdman because who Nikki, uh, uh, Nikki is, they allowed her and stuck with it and watched the brand grow. So um, the, the, the parallel for you is uh, that, that I'm making, the analogy that I'm making is that even if you don't get the, the feedback initially, if you determine from the beginning that you're going to be in it for this brand, for the marathon, then it allows you to get the feedback, be in, be in beta, change some of the characteristics uh, based upon the feedback from the community and the crowd, not from competitors. This is, you know, most important for the music business. Most of the uh, fans and followers on certain sites are all wannabe musicians. So you're never going to get, uh, nobody's getting five stars because most of the fans around those sites want to be the artists. But if you can carve out who actually likes the artist, um, you can look at the analytics and tell who like you know, really is uh, genuine and their affection for that artist, then you can begin to shape the, the brand a little better. So that, I, I hope that uh, answered some, some of what you were asking. Uh, left out. Uh, so there's a fine line between creating a character and a caricature in the artist. So how do you decide at what point do you pull back so that you're not looking at someone who's you know, creating a cartoon versus a right. real person? Well, today, um, again, we, we had to be sensitive because we're streaming, right? So even when I just named off some of the names, you know, I was being sensitive to, you know, fans and business people affiliating, associated, watching, and maybe not understanding uh, we're doing strictly business. Um, so, but right now in that space of, uh, in the space of entertainment, character, characters probably are working better, right? Again, if you look at the top 10 artists and you point out the, the characteristics of the top five, those are not pe normal people walking around that are going to walk in and sit next to you in the way that they either address or their positioning. So right now, to, to, to cut through, you might want to get a purple hat and a pink shirt and some green shoes um, just to walk in and catch everybody's attention. And then once you get their, their attention, because again, we're talking about marathon and the whole person, you start to introduce the other characteristics. Again, if you go back, Lady Gaga day one, to Lady Gaga today with an agenda, a political position, a social position, uh, a mobilized, crowdsourced audience, monsters, little monsters, this is who I am, all of that now from here, right? So characters can be very powerful as long as you, tr you don't, you don't uh, overdo it for the long haul. So that's kind of the answer. Don't overdo it for the long haul. It's, and they do it on their own. I'm watching, I'm watching from an artistic standpoint the artist will take that character to a certain point. Don't worry, I got a, you know, I got, I got a bunch of kids, so I understand. Um, the characters, they'll take it to a certain point, then they pull back on their own now. Like, um, and not to overemphasize it, but Lady Gaga said, this is who I am, this is who I am. Wait a minute, I don't like you. You're talking negative against a certain group of individuals, and I want my voice heard. So character step aside, and now, the woman would like to say something to you. I don't agree with your message, and here's my message. I'm going to defend this particular cause or group. So I watch artists today. Um, they'll create a character, but then they'll also step outside of the character and deal with issues. Um, unlike previously we've had in the last 10 years, certain athletes who never addressed one issue, who had all of the voice, could have addressed issues, could have been very helpful in a lot of ways. But if you look at their history, they never addressed one issue. They just, they were happy to be that athlete. There were names. You're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple of them, though. But they remain nameless. And that's OK, because again, it can't be forced upon you. You can't, be, you can't like join the activism class here to, and say, I'm an activist. And you walk around Stanford all day saying you're activist. And somebody said, well, what's your issue? I'm an activist. <laughs> it's not going to work too long. You have to really have uh, an idea and an issue, and it has to be organic for you know to be engaging. Uh, change in your personal brand, <coughs> particularly given that you know you want to be open and honest and transparent, but at the same time, someone can look back and you know, let's say for you, see what you were doing 20 years ago, and compare that to who you are today. For us. You know, that'll be true in 20 years, and 
Well, you still <laughs> 20 years, you almost weren't born. Huh? I'm, a little, I'm a little older than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I mean, it, for us, like, the tweets that I send out today, you know, which, which are funny to me and maybe a little on PC, are still going to be around right, right. 15, 20 years. And so how do you manage you know, how the image changes and, how you, you know, what, what's appropriate changes? Well, for, for, for me personally, I, I really view the world as real, real time, actual real time, right? And I, again, I'm also keenly and acutely aware that uh, the National Archives bought the Twitter holes. You, you, you do know that, right? So every tweet is being held forever in posterity. All of your tweets, not some of them. Every one of them are going into the National Historic Archives to be recalled 500 years from now. And I'm aware of that. I'm, so, so for me, um, if I tweet it, I can stand by it. Uh, if, I, if I tweet it, even as a joke, I, I can live with it. Um, because one of the things that, that I'm emphasizing as a personal brand and marathon branding is I refuse to be one thing because I don't know anybody who is just one thing. Even if you look at all of your, his, your heroes historically, we know that they all had flaws. So I don't want to be the flawless hero or Mr. Perfect. None of those guys or brands will survive in today's real-time world. The new heroes will be the heroes that have flaws. That's the new heroes. Why? Because they're really like you. They're closer to you. So the old positioning of, you know, creating this character, spotless, sinless, blah, 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 it, it won't work. And if you take that position, you don't have to overanalyze every tweet. You don't have to worry about it. Everybody, do they agree with it? And by the way, since you guys are going to run enterprise, you're going to run the new businesses, you also won't judge your, your, your employees the way they're saying you're going to be judged. In other words, what are they telling you? That you better be careful of everything you say on Facebook and on Twitter and all that because... When you go in and you put your resume in, they're going to review it and they're going to see that's you and you're not going to get a job. Well, it depends on who's doing the reviewing. If that person also tweets and on Facebook and have said some things, they're going to go, hey, you know, I've said 20 things I wish I could take back. So in the future, it won't be as sensitive an issue. But, um, yeah, in answering your, you know, your question, James, that my, my thing is to be whole and to be um, uh, full of possible, you know, flaws. It's, it's, that's, that's the journey. You know, that's the journey. Um, there, in this room, if you haven't made any mistakes, you wouldn't be here right now. The, the fact that you are here is the, pro is, the, is the product of some mistakes that you have made. And yet you ended up here, each and every one of you guys. So, you know, branding really is, marathon branding is about understanding that from the beginning. Build that into who you are. Build that into your brand. That, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not flawless. But I can tell you that if we were to argue, you know, Republican and Democrats, you know, um, I, I said before the election, I said, wow, the Republicans won't get this back for 16 years. Sam, what are you talking about? They, they haven't even lost the first one for four years. I said, no, they, they won't get it back. Why? Because they're pointing out every flaw of everybody that they can. And then what that does is set you up because now they turn the camera back and say, oh, you did this, and you're saying that his platform is not the one I should vote for because he's not flawless. Well, you see, it, it, what happened with that was even two years in, I want to see your birth certificate. <laughs> it's, the way, it's the way it works. Once you start focusing on that minute, I, I'm going to find a flaw. You know, even recently, you mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, Jason, and you threw a name out. And uh, I won't throw that name back out, but that name started saying, again, I'm going to go to this issue. That issue got handled, and what's the next issue? Let me see your academic record. This is nonsense. This is not what we're about in this generation. We want substance. We're living in real time. We want to know how we're going to fix and solve problems and issues. And no one person or one man has to, but the community can solve it. Because the other side of social media and I'm setting aside branding right now, I'm just talking uh, specifically social media, is that now we can crowdsource information from the world. So all of this distant learning, all of these brains are all now connected. So when we say solve it, it's not just solve it me, it's not just solve it Stanford, 
It's, it's all of us solve it, and we're all connected, and we can all give in, input. It's a whole new world. It's a, it's a whole new place, a whole new paradigm shift. All right, one more question. Great. I'll, I'll pose it. Um, so for Akiba, what would you hope for her personal brand? Ah, so for my daughter Akiba's personal brand. So she is a uh, hook'em horn. She graduated from the University of Texas uh, last year. Last year? Another one. Oh, another one. All right. <laughs> uh, and there was one more in here yeah, in on the commercial. Oh. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna retweet that commercial. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That's what I wanted to do. We talked about Nike earlier, so I want to retweet that commercial. Um, but what I hope for for Akiba, why I'm I'm doing that is that that Akiba is comfortable enough um, that she's you know taking my advice to, to feel like she's not under any pressure to be anything other than whatever she wants to be, whatever she want to do, but utilize these tools. I mean, she's, oh, how old are you, 22 now, Keep 23? 23. Say daddy action, 23. <laughs> That's how it really goes. She's 23 now. You sang in the opera at 18. Mm -hmm. So you, we, I know you can sing. You made opera. You got two degrees in four years, so I know you can think. <laughs> See, so she's academic, and you always have been very independent. You left graduated and went to Spain for six months. I had a concert in Belgium and you showed up. <laughs> you navigated through Europe by yourself. So um, and I had no idea. So okay. I know you know how to navigate the world. I know you have talents and gifts and everything. So my dream for you is whatever makes you happy, but, but, but do it. Just do it and do it comfortably. That's what I hope for her brand. I hope that your brand ultimately uh, really means to somebody that uh, you, you're a difference maker, that, that you will impact the world um, from a humanity standpoint. No matter what the gifts you use, at the end of it, they'll also say, oh, and she's a good you know, person. She helped them do this or help with that. So that's awesome. what I hope. So uh, that uh, so, I, so what, what, is, what is his name? I, I promised that I would. Uh, Kalen. Kalen Thornton. No, no, no. Kaylin wasn't tweeting the video, though. Yeah. Or Max. Max, yeah. Max was tweeting. Exactly. See, now you know half of your intelligence is recall, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that. It's like uh, short-term recall is like really like the, the, the best, right? So you don't even have to be smart then. You just have to like have great memory. Um, so wall hammers. <laughs> uh, there, there, ah, there oh. you are. All right. Oh, so you were listening to the stream, huh? <laughs> Yeah, all right, all right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Oh. <laughs> See that? I like that. So um, for those of you who guys want to know more about sort of social technology, not from a personal brand perspective, um, go online and just uh, Google Hammer at Stanford. He has a couple of videos. Last year he did one for uh, Post Power Social Technology with Robert Scoble, Louis Lemur, and um, also Garth Sloaner. Um, so that's on, on, uh, on video, so I would encourage you to check that out because um, the chapters that go by with Hammer at Stanford are, are quite remarkable. And someday he's going to let out that personal brand cave. <laughs> so he has a gorgeous piece of work on personal brand. So thanks so much, Hammer. All right, we'll thank you.